All right. I'll be reading some of this and talking you through, and let's see what happens. On the 23rd of June 2015, at a public space called Plaza de San Agustín Bell, in the middle of Barcelona, not so far from the Arc de Triomphe. I stripped naked and entered a small enclosure made up of string that would be my world for the next 30 hours. Outside there's a sign. It says, this is where Rasmus exists. He'll be here from 12, Thursday the 23rd of June, until 18, on Friday the 24th of June. 30 hours in total. Rasmus has not brought anything to this place. He is cut off from the basic necessities and is therefore completely dependent on the people he meets. He is only allowed to leave the space temporarily if someone else stands in his place. Help Rasmus. You can stay updated on facebook.com slash and help us with documentation, sub X3. The rules of clear itself is simple, yet strong. Here we go. <laughs> My name is Rasmus, and uh, I'm a performing arts practitioner based in Aarhus, Denmark. I'm the co-founder and co-leader of the performance theater company called Teleflux. <laughs> as well as a freelance performer, director, and dramaturge. Subsistence X3 was the third and until now latest of the Subsistence series. Uh, it started in 2010. It started with Ursula and myself in the corner. It was a performance installation with two inhabitants performed during an art festival. It was called Nubigone, translated into Settlers. Uh, the concept evolved around the idea that when there, ever there are settlers, there are also people with little or no subsistence. So we wanted to investigate the balance of the ecosystem of this settler project by letting ourselves be totally dependent on the neighbors and visitors that we didn't yet know. Subsistence X2 was the first outdoor version and it was manifested during the 2012 Aarhus Festival as part of a festival concept called Town in Town. To make the dependency part of the concept more clear, I chose to be alone for X2, which definitely made some big changes. First and foremost, in the amount of communication. And subsistence X3 it was part of a small French festival called Experimental Room Festival in Barcelona. It was, it's led by performance artist Maria Stoyanova. And even though it was part of the festival, it still took place in this public plaza where it was not explicitly part of any cultural context or artistic context. During, so a little bit behind the concept, um, during the the performance in Barcelona. I heard myself explaining again and again and again to passers-by. Uh, they would ask, why are you doing this? What is this? What's the point? And a lot more. And I kind of noted the sum of average answers and it sounds a little bit like this. Um, okay, basically this is a, this is an investigation. It's a social and artistic research. It's about what happens when I stand in front of you and I say that I depend on you. When I say that, that I, when, what happens when I claim this dependency. I feel we talk a lot about independence, but maybe it's more about dependence or interdependence. So, so through this I want to focus on dependence and in this sense it's a double investigation. It's an investigation into my own reactions about 
being completely dependent on people I don't know, people who just pass by. And at the same time, it's uh, an investigation into the reactions of these people passing by, encountering this plea for help. And now I would add, in this specific context, it's not a performance that deals with survival, it doesn't deal with the edges of human existence. Mm. But it's more about the, the social element and the empathetic element and how, when, and why, and who we choose to help. During this performance I also get in touch with my own basic needs and with the adaptability that I find out that I have when it comes to communication. When you share and share your thoughts and meet all these different kind of people in a very short span of time. So revisiting this piece, it's been a, uh, it's been good. Uh, it has opened up a array of different thoughts, different perspectives, reflections. Um, and yeah, I, I would start in, in something that's more of a confrontation. So, confrontation part one. Slightly drunk woman. Hostile attitude. But she engages. She does not seem to understand the concept. Questions my right to do this. She thinks that I'm just a bored, rich person. Asks why I'm not doing something for the homeless people that gathers nearby. Who are you to receive all these goods when there are people suffering just streets away? Are you not just a hypocrite? Safe. Playing the role of the artist. Playing the role of the martyr. What do you know about suffering? About what it takes to live on the streets? She's convinced that this has no effect whatsoever that people are talking and debating and reflecting on the subject of subsistence and dependence. No effect. They'll, and they'll just forget. And she challenges, she challenges the setup, the strings, the separation. She's saying, no frontiers. Part two. A few hours later, she's back. Now a little less drunk, actually. A little bit more interested in the dialogue. She sits down with me, and then again she says, people will not change. They're just sheep. Did you really need to do this to discover that? You need to break down barriers, the frontiers, the limits. You need to open the doors to your own home if you really want to ask somebody for help. She marks my Coca-Cola. She is criticizing these things, and I, I can't really explain to her that I'm, I'm really against the exploitations of multinational companies, that I don't support it. When I'm sitting right here with two big bottles of sweet sugar water, she wants to enter the space, she wants to break it. She ends up burning the strings. A strength that has been my safety zone for the last 28 hours. In some ways, she's doing exactly what I would wish somebody to do. She engages. She intervenes. But at the same time, it freaks me out. It makes me unsure. I feel unsafe. I don't know what her limits are. I don't know what she could do. But I know that she pinpoints some of the cracks in this performance, the weaknesses and the strengths. I'm just not sure that we agree which is which. But I know that when she's left, I feel more vulnerable than before, just because these strings are gone. And 
this experience resonates quite well with um, with the idea about borders or the limits that Bauman quotes a Bethlehem Lucci for. Says limit, however, as a Bethlehem Lucci expresses, also stands for confinement, frontier, separation. It therefore also signifies recognition of the other, the different, the irreducible. The encounter with otherness is an experience that puts us to a test. From it is born the temptation to reduce difference by force. While it may equally generate the challenge of communication as a constantly renewed endeavor. And this challenge of communication was very clear in this instant, and not really made any easier by the challenges of language. She was not fluent in English. I don't know any Catalan. But at the same time, the woman ends up trying, actually, to reduce our differences through the forces of fire. She tries to break the barrier instead of actually reaching across it. And this setup with the strings and the sign, it was all made to kind of frame this performance installation. We know from neuroaesthetic experiments that the prefrontal cortex is affected directly by the way we experiences, no, the way experiences here, artistic experiences are framed. For example, a small, an act as placing a sign with a title next to a painting, or framing a series of paintings as belonging to a certain art institution. It's a Danish uh, scientist called uh, Martin Sko, who's wrote uh, about it in a, a book that's called Emotions and Cognition, Birds of Cognition. It's a, it's a very simple and effective way of changing the per perception and categorization of an ex aesthetic experience. And also, therefore, it plays into a third layer of consequence, which is that it calls for action. So the two social psychologists, Latine and Dali, have categorized five essential parameters that need to happen in order for somebody to take action. So an individual must one, notice what is happening, two, interpret the event as an emergency, three, experience feelings of responsibility, four, believe that they have the skills to help, five, make a conscious choice to offer assistance. So looking into these five elements, one, the sign, the strings, makes this performance installation pretty obvious, without being too much, I think. That's the idea, anyway. Some does not notice. Quite a lot of people notices, but chooses to pass by. Many people stop to read the sign, and then some chooses to engage. Okay, so is this an emergency? In the deep sense of the word, no. But, it is something unusual. It is something that has emerged without warning as an intervention in the space. And it requires immediate action, especially in the beginning of the 30 hours, something like this. And we also, producing this, helps a little bit on the way by choosing to write on the sign, to call out for help on the sign, writing help Asmus. This spills into the third parameter, which is uh, to experience feelings of responsibility. And if you have already chosen to stop and read this sign, you're already engaging to a certain extent. And if you understand and sympathize with, with the project, then even more so. The skills to help, yeah. I need very basic things when I'm in there. It's, it's a very specific time frame. And the skills needed to help me are very close to everyday socializing skills. You can take my place for five minutes. You can buy me a cup of coffee. There's no special skills needed. You even help me just by way of stopping and reading and discussing the project with your friends. 
or about telling me about your reactions and feelings regarding the project. And five, making a conscious choice. This ranges all the way from a Slavic talking man who had just had to ask why. Apparently one of the only English words that he knew. Over a neighbor coming down with a small towel and a tank top to cover my naked body. Thank you to her. To the people who would come back several times, bringing food, bringing books, bringing Valium and pot and beer. Hmm. As a contrast to that, another perspective. There's a woman at the edge of the square. She sits there to the side. I'm pretty sure she was here yesterday as well. Around my mother's age. Probably older. Looking through the bins, scrounging for food. I don't think she's even looked at me. But then again, why should she? The remarkable thing is not that she hasn't looked at me, but that nobody has looked at her. Nobody has offered her their attention in a sober way. Nobody has walked over to her and asked her what she needs, how they can help. She just sits there, waiting for the sun to pass. And in the meantime, I've had people coming back to me as if they were my friends, my guests, my beneficiaries, coming with food and clothes and coffee and an air mattress for the pump. All that and more. I think I know why. I think I would have done the same. But I'm not sure that makes me any more comfortable about it. And I very much think that it, it also comes back to this. The time frame, the skills to help. What does it take to help me? Not much. What does it take to help somebody Maybe in a deep crisis, maybe not, but we don't know. Here, we read it at this instant, we read the sign, and we know. So in the proposal, I was considering whether this was a success, how this performance was a success, how it was not a success. Um, and during and after, this performance, I had this strange feeling. I felt like, like the perf this performance was definitely a six, very, very successful, and definitely not. At the same time, we had hopes for the performance; they were fulfilled. Get Rasmus through the night, check. Get people to help, check. Engage a local audience, check. Get people thinking and talking, check. But inside me, there is still something that was just slightly off. Early in the morning, I wrote in a small notebook I'd gotten the night before. Early morning, point proven. Why go on? It's the same problem as last time. What do I need now? Entertainment, sunscreen, hat? So once again, we have pro proven that people are ready to help. Once again, I have proven that I can ask for and get help from strangers in this setup. But I had come to doubt the effect of the performance. If someone would praise the performance, I felt more bitter and cynical than grateful. I would be thinking about all the people, all the human beings that actually live their lives on the edge of subsistence. The people who cannot just stop as soon as they reach the 30 hour mark and go have a shower and a mojito. So what this difference does this work make? And even though I have yet to complete do something fully, I've come to understand that the perspective of the performer, me, and the perspective of the initiating artist or the artistic director, also me, are not necessarily the same. So while the performer got fed up and bored by explaining and disseminating the story, the setup, the concept, 
Felt tearful, and grateful, confused, and dazed, scared, and tired, hopeful, and happy. Had strong empathetic reactions. The artistic director must try to look at the project from the outside. Not missing on any of these reactions, but surely not missing any of the reactions from the public either. The thoughtful talks, the engagement, the continuity, and the surprise. Okay. A final perspective on the performance installation comes from Sigmund Bauman and his notion of tourists and vagabonds. He offers the rather poetic imagery that portrays mobility as an ambiguous yet sought after freedom and value in the mobile world. The local, as meaning holder and creator, is disappearing. And to a certain degree, everyone is now either a tourist, traveling the world more or less freely, seeking pleasures and money wherever possible, or a vagabond, traveling only to escape the horrific or at least stale situations you're in, trying to fit into the picture of the tourist, the traveling consumer, but with no means to do so and with no interest from the tourists to let you in. On the contrary, as long as they are vagabonds, the tourists feel more safe in their own role as tourists. So in this world of mobility, the world of the locally bound is shrinking and fast. Being local in a globalized world is a sign of deprivation, degradation. And the world of mobility is a world of time. Space does not matter anymore, and time is filled to the brim. The opposition, the world of the locally bound, is space. A heavy, perpetual space that binds time and keeps it out of reach for the inhabitants. They cannot control time, but neither are they controlled by it as their stamp in and stamp out ancestors. They can just kill time or be killed by it. So what I'm considering here with Bauman as co-pilot is to see subsistence X3 not as a tourist posing as a vagabond, but rather as a third position, a heterotopia that poses the question, what happens when you're radically local by choice? What happens when you embrace the fact of our interdependency? Even if this is a game, it's also real. And even if people are sheep, sheep are also social creatures. So if we stay social, if we stay connected through our bodies, through our faces, through our actions, there's still hope. I hope. <laughs> a final memory, two final memories. One, he's back with a backpack and a longboard. He looks like this city gave him a birth to him, formed him, made him who he is. I'm his friend now. He longboarded to the edge of the city and back to bring me some food, a blanket, and even a Valium if I need to sleep. He'll be checking up on me, he says. I'm not sure about his name. I think it's Sergei. But I remember him. He gave me his time came back, he looked out for me, he cared. Remember two, from my notebook, it says, good looking guy, middle of the night, says, you made me think today. during the 30 hours and uh, <coughs> it's in Danish and English so it's free for anyone to I was planning on reading it but it will take more than the three minutes I think maybe you could put it up for I can put it up like next that. to the yeah. schedule over there yeah, yeah I'll do that great. okay if there's are there any kind of just burning questions just something you need to ask right now
Yes. The same people again yes. and again. Yeah. Yeah. Sergey was was one of them. He came back four or five times. Yeah. Uh, there was a family that came by one day and then they didn't really have anything to offer and then they came back the next day with food and uh, so there was there was quite a few people, especially people who lived nearby would come back and check up on me. And, yeah. uh, I've done it these three times that that I introduced it. So I've done it in, in Aarhus, uh, inside ones and outside ones, and then in Barcelona now. So that's the third and last one, so now. Uh, in, in, in comparison, Aarhus and, and Barcelona, not much. Actually, there is a bit of difference in, in how people would engage. Uh, there's a difference in when they read the sign. In Aarhus, they would look at me afterwards. In Barcelona, they would look away. But there, it's these small details. But the, the amount of things and the generosity in general is, is pretty much the same. Bella? I think it took. I'm not. I should have checked. I can see it on the on the file. I think maybe 15 minutes, <laughs> 20 maybe. And the first thing was not pants. It was a very small towel. <laughs> I would sit here and open up, and then a tank top that was a little bit too small for our feet. But it was a it was a great help. The next thing was these briefs, very pink, also a little bit small. <laughs> very delicate. <laughs> Mm, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'll think about that for tomorrow, but one, one thing that springs to mind is, is there's something called helpless high, which is that as if you help people, you experience this kind of, I don't know, if, if it's probably not adrenaline, it's probably dopamine or something else, uh, and, and it, that will kind of get you helping again and again. <coughs> so it could be very like biologically that, but uh, it was also that we had a great meeting and a great chat and we connected on an empathetic level. So we have a question from Diane and then Warren and then Ulta. Could be, yeah. Actually, one of the first times he was there, maybe the first time, he exchanged with me and was in the square for the four minutes while I ran to the bathroom, which was the only time I could go out. Yeah. All right. So thank you. Safe questions for tomorrow.